If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at CottageBlogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Well, hello and welcome once again to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and I'm delighted to be back with you again. A couple of years ago, I believe, gosh, 2015, I last spoke to today's guest, and his name is Scott Shatford from Air DNA. And Scott has, so Scott and I have some sort of history that goes back a number of years and um, references a very, very beautiful golden retriever called Rocky. It's one of those coincidences um, that that you don't, well, you hear about quite often, but maybe has never happened to you that you meet somebody randomly and then find that you have a very close connection of some sort that you never knew you had. So in order to understand what the heck I'm talking about, you would need to go back to the first interview I did with Scott. And I'm going to put that in the show notes. So, uh, uh, you can go back and actually read the show notes for that episode and you will see the story. And probably a, I think there's a picture of Rocky there as well. But yes, yeah, so we um, Scott and I have this uh, golden retriever connection. At the time I spoke to Scott uh, a couple of years ago, he had properties in uh, Santa Monica. They were going through all sorts of issues with regulations at that time. Um, so we, we we focused quite a bit on that and a bit less on what uh, Air DNA was doing. And I wanted to catch up with him and see what's happened in the past uh, three years. Uh, get him to sort of summarize the changes that have happened in Airbnb since then. I mean, we know many of them, but certainly from his perspective as somebody who works closely in the Airbnb sphere, uh, I wanted to capture his thoughts and where he thinks the uh, the industry going is going from that perspective. We're also going to talk about investment and where the best spots are. And you may be surprised at some of the the, the best value locations for an Airbnb, Airbnb investment right now. We're going to have a look at what the hotspots are, what an investor, what new investor needs to take into account before entering the short-term rental market because it's uh, it's a little bit of a minefield, particularly in terms of regulations. So I, I'd like him to guide us through the steps that a new investor should take. So without further ado, let's move on over to my interview with Scott Shatford of Air DNA. Well, I'm delighted to have with me today Scott Shatford from Air DNA. Scott, it's been three years. It doesn't seem like that. I know we met up in Barcelona a couple of years ago, but uh, it's amazing how time flies. It does indeed. And uh, amazing how much we can get done in three short years. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm think, I, I sometimes think I've been standing still because I'm just sitting here doing s- the same thing and <laughs> talking to you and saying it's just like yesterday. But, uh, <laughs> but what's happened to you in the three years? The last time we spoke, I remember that... Um, we were talking about the properties that you had in Santa Monica. And at that time, the issue of regulations was a, a, a pretty big one. So, so tell us where you are, you know, what happened at that time and where you are now. Sure. Yeah. So three years ago, I was sitting working in a garage for the most part, uh, just like, just like you. And uh, now we've got 25 people at AirDNA and, uh, you know, have global coverage and have 10,000 plus clients. So, it's been an exciting three years for us as we've really grown out our data platform and really figured out how to make it useful for everyday operators uh, in the vacation rental space. Um, it, you know, with my properties in particular, yeah, that was a bit of a, a bumpy road in Santa Monica. As you may know, they were one of the first cities to completely ban short-term rentals, and that's where I had uh, all of my properties, which was unfortunate. Um, so, you know, I definitely went through a, a legal process with them, definitely try to fight them at every corner. Um, but because I was a bit public and in a lot of press and media, 
it, they came after me pretty hard. Uh, so they ended up shutting me down, giving me a misdemeanor offense for running illegal vacation rental properties. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it was about a four thousand dollar fine and not really um, that impactful besides the time and energy I had to put into it. But uh, so, yeah, I'm not operating any properties now. I'm really focusing on the data business full time now. Excellent. So what's uh, what, what's happened in the Airbnb world for you? That's been really impactful over the past three years. Can you summarize the most important changes that have sort of impacted uh, impacted your business and caused it to go from, you know, sitting in the garage to 25 employees? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the story, there is a big story about regulation, right? I try not to focus too much on regulation because it is in mostly select markets. Typically, cities are just looking to get their fair share of taxes and is trying to you know, protect their neighborhoods. And it's not a massive issue, except for in some of the kind of New York and Paris's and some of the larger, larger markets that get a lot of press. Um, you know, it's always important to know what the regulation is, kind of understand where your city council is in terms of how it's developing legislation and understanding what the tax policies are. You know, but I think that a lot, you know, the much more exciting story is around, you know, the opportunity it's creating for entrepreneurs in this space and the amount of professional money that's entering into the market these days. I think that's the big story over the last three years is that this institutional money is really seeing this is not just kind of a blip on the map and Airbnb is, you know, kind of created some new vacation rental supply. You know, they see this as really the future of, uh, you know, how people are investing in real estate, how people want to travel and how people really want to live moving forward. And so I think that, you know, overall kind of big theme is, you know, one of the exciting things that's really taken hold over the last few years. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember going to a VRMA conference and probably about um, eight, eight years ago now, and they were talking about, you know, the, the vacation rental business going mainstream and coming into not quite adulthood, but sort of, you know, <laughs> puberty, I guess. And and there was a lot of discussion about, you know, where where it where it was going. And that that was just before um, Airbnb sort of appeared on the scene. And it seems like that uh, that movement of the short what what has become from the vacation rental business now known far more as the short term rental industry has has become something that is is just as appealing to investors now as uh, as other forms of property investment. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the the numbers that people are raising right now for you know basically property management companies and companies that are kind of end to end property management, you know, kind of acquiring the properties, leasing them long term, and then operating them. I mean, there's you know 50 million here, 100 million there. I mean, these numbers were astronomical and, and unheard of a few years ago. So it is interesting that people have, are really seeing this as a as you know, there's a lot of Billion dollar companies are going to be made, you know, here in this time period. And that was not the consensus, uh, you know, a few years ago. Yeah. Is there still room for the individual investor? I mean, you're talking about major investment here um, in, in terms of millions. But is, this, is, there, is, there, is, is this still a good business for the, the individual entrepreneur who wants to, to get in and, uh, and to start investing in this type of property? Without a doubt. There, there's some things that these larger players cannot do or do well, right? Scaling vacation rentals is incredibly difficult, right? Because this is a lot about quality. It's a lot about personalization. It's a lot about experience. And, you know, it's really hard to try to replicate that when you've got a thousand plus properties. Um, and so the kind of the fine touches on design with the communication, uh, with really understanding your market and when there's a lack of properties or a lack of supply, I mean, there's still a huge opportunity for the individual investor. And it's still dominated. Airbnb is dominated by the individual kind of the uh, host, right? It's still you know, 60 to 70% dominated by, by the individual. So there's still a ton of opportunity there and there always will be. Yeah, that, that, that's good to hear because, you know, it, it, it would be a shame to see that type of market go towards the sort of, the, what I've, the, the phrase I've heard used is hotelification. So it's just another, you know, it's just another hotel type of building, but you get the whole, the whole shebang, I guess, you know, you get the couple of bedrooms and a kitchen and, but really it's not much different from a hotel. If, if we, if you're talking in terms of, of these units being built now that have just turned right over to, uh, to short-term rental. 
So as you say, the easy to lose that whole uniqueness and personality that comes with um, an independent owned property. Yep, I totally agree. And, and consumers are choosing different things, right? Some consumers want to kind of stay in a hotel-like-ish property, right? Like kind of stale, not a lot of character. They're there for a business trip. And then there's a whole huge segment that wants to stay in really unique properties with unique owners, wants to meet them, wants to chat with them. And, and so there will always be this segmentation of what people are looking for. And there will always be a big opportunity for this more kind of high touch, highly individual sorts of units. Um, and so that, I think that's what we're seeing is just that people are really trying to figure out how to specialize in these different types of accommodations. And there will always be the opportunity for that more personal sort of uh, uh, lodging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was at a, a cottage show in Ottawa um, a week or so back, and there was uh, the, the, they were displaying a, I mean, little more than, I mean, it looked like a container. I mean, we all know that, you know, containers are being used now and converted into um, accommodation. But this was an architectural design of uh, property, which is very easy. It, it, I mean, I think I'm talking here about, you know, the tiny house movement. This was a very small very compact um, property that uh, that the and I talked to the architect and he said yes a lot of people who were who were thinking about buying them were going to be using them for Airbnb purposes and uh, and it got me thinking about this whole you know, individual uniqueness tiny houses yurts airstreams um, that really is it's, it's almost like that was the backbone of Airbnb once you got beyond renting out the couch. Yeah, it's evolved quickly since then, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, at last count, I saw you know eighty different property types that have been listed on Airbnb, and that is all of your yurts and mud huts and you know everything in between. So it is interesting as people are finding these opportunities. Um, yeah, it just can take so many different shapes, can it? I mean, people are just parking their RVs kind of by the national park for a bit, you know, in the, in the peak season. Or people are taking containers and moving them from southwest, south by southwest over to Coachella, right? Just following where the people are going. Yeah. You know, people are finding really kind of unique business models on, on how to capitalize on this. And I think we'll just see, you know, more creativity as time goes on. But I suppose in, in, you know, in terms of, of plain investment, people are more likely to be considering you know, the, uh, the, the more traditional style of uh, property, whether it be a condo or a townhouse or, or a, a, a full home. I, I know that um, AirDNA look at all sorts of locations and you do studies in what are the hotspots, what are the places where people should go and buy. And I looked at looking at a blog post on the Air DNA website and really quite interested in some of the graphs that you were showing as to where these these hot spots are. And I wonder if you can share some of that with us. Yeah, I think there's two ways to look at the hot spots, right? We, we typically on our kind of public data where we're looking at cities where uh, demand is high, where real estate prices are relatively low. And, you know, some markets do pop up and it popped up over the last five years, really, as, as soon as I started looking at this data. And those are some markets like Palm Springs is always up there. Nashville is always up there. Um, and, and there's a lot of others that you can check out when you go there. I think the trend is not there's not really many cities these days where it's just a grand slam. Like you just go into Nashville, you plop anything down there and you're going to just you're going to make three times your money back. I think it's getting much more hyper local. Right. Um, so if we're thinking about like a market, like I'm in Denver, so I'll use Denver as an example. You know, there's a hotel hub and it used to be kind of why don't you get an Airbnb right across the street from the hotel, open up a nice one bedroom high end condo and compete with that hotel. And I think that strategy has really changed a lot where people are now looking kind of by the university or by the hospital or by anything that's kind of a little bit more suburban where there's no hotel supply. And that there is a little bit of demand that they can tap into there. I think one of the big advantages in this kind of short-term rental world is that, you know, you could purchase a property and have it set up for rental in 60 days. Uh, a hotel is going to take, you know, close to six years to figure out where they're going to go and build something and get it operational. And so what we're finding is that, you know, the short-term rentals are kind of filling in these small voids within cities. And there's still lots of opportunities to kind of fill in, you know, where is there a lack of supply 
in these sort of niche markets or in super um, hyper localized way in different cities. So, so can you give us some uh, some examples of some areas that are that are hot at the moment? Yeah, in terms of different cities that are hot. I mean, I think what's what's moving is people are moving in away from the big cities, right? San Francisco's and New York's and LA's where there's been good money being made and there's either regulatory issues or just a saturation issue. So if I'm talking about the US specifically, people are looking at these secondary markets. So this could be a Cleveland, it could be a St. Louis, it could be sort of these markets that were looked over previously and now people are looking at more seriously. So that's where a lot of the Airbnb kind of market players are going, you know, there's the smaller units in these secondary sort of markets. So there's always the, the massive growth is always in the Southern States, right? Like Arizona is seeing a you know, massive growth and we're seeing a lot of growth around the national parks. Like I mentioned before, um, not a lot of hotel supply around there, lots of uh, vacationers that are going in group travel. And so we're seeing a lot of growth around like Yosemite or Moab or, or different national parks like Sedona in the U.S. is seeming to be a big place to invest these days. Oh, you mentioned Sedona, always my favorite place. And of course, the, uh, we used to be huge regulatory issues surrounding Sedona itself. And I understand that Arizona um, removed some of those restrictions. Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, Arizona made it illegal to make short-term rentals illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how I understand the law. And I understand that's really the um, sort of policy that they're trying to pass, you know, in other states in the, in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, Arizona has been a real big hot spot over the last uh, 18 months. Uh, you know, so much so that it's pretty hard to find a good return there. Um, it, it, it's, it's, that's what our data is saying, at least. So, so this is what Air DNA does. It produces data that that helps people to to determine the lo- the best location for them to invest. I think our data supplies a lot of different needs. There is the investor that's trying to figure out where the best returning properties are, where a property is earning, you know, over $100,000, and, and how do they kind of replicate the success of existing uh, properties. Um, we like to think of our data as really helping operators as well, people that are really trying to figure out how to benchmark their property's performance against their peers, and just really understanding the seasonality of their marketplaces so they can figure out how to price better, understanding competitive pricing, understanding... Um, really anything that goes into understanding your market, understanding the guests that are coming to your market and understanding how to benchmark your performance versus your peers. Um, you know, we really have modeled our business off of Smith travel research in the hotel world. And they, you know, every single hotel in the entire world really subscribes to that data to understand truly how they stack up versus competition and where are areas for improvement uh, in their business. So, so that sort of segues nicely into um, what I wanted to ask about what a new investor needs to take into account before entering the short-term market. So you, you've mentioned some of those things, and I really want you to, uh, to, to expand a little bit on those. Um, you know, regulations are certainly one because you can be stepping into a minefield just blindly buying into a location without researching the um, the regulations that might be have have been imposed or in the process of being imposed because that's uh, that that's that's something I heard from somebody recently that they'd when they bought into a location there was very minimal legislation and regulations but once they'd closed on the property it was about the same time as new regulations came in that they had not been aware of and that really negatively impacted their their plans and their strategy. So regulations definitely, and I'll I'll ask you about that, but what else do investors need to take into account in terms of of their their research and planning before they even start this this journey? Well, it's a tough one. I'm trying to figure out how nerdy to get with this answer. (laughs) Well, um, you mentioned, you know, you know, let, let let's start with how how do you find out if an area is saturated? Yeah, so in our market minder product, what we've generated is what we call a market grade. And our market grade is is supposed to encompass a lot of these metrics that investors are looking at when getting into a market. And so we'll talk through a couple of those, right? So you already hit on regulation. You know, one of this, these kind of concepts that we brought from sort of the consumer retail market is sort of same store sales. 
is a property that existed a year ago making more today than it was a year ago? And that's a great kind of proxy to understand, you know, are people, is this market uh, still heavier on demand than it is on supply? Is demand growing faster than supply? Are properties making more today than they were a year ago? And that's a great metric to look at. Um, we, we look at just general occupancy throughout the year. We notice a lot of investors, they don't want to be in boom or bust markets. They don't want to be in ski towns where they might do great, but snow season was bad and now they lost all their money. They want to be able to have some, some guaranteed income uh, profitability on a monthly basis. So people are looking at seasonality for that person, uh, for that. People are also looking at like how fast does a property get to full occupancy, right? So if you put a p- place on the platform on Airbnb and home away, how long does that take it to get ramped up? And that is kind of telling people, um, you know, exactly when are they going to start making their money back? And is it how competitive that marketplace is for, for those travel demands? How do they find that out? I can see that they can go to home away and Airbnb and see how many properties are listed in an area and see, see factually what is currently going on. How can they um, ascertain how fast it's going to be for them to start making their money back? Yeah, it's not in kind of our standard data product. It is something that we do have in a more raw data format. So we, we know we know when a property is first listed. We know when it becoming goes to market, and we can see how fast it ramps up. Uh, so it's not in kind of one of our standard product sets, but it is available in, in more of a raw data format for uh, investors to dig into. Yeah. So so if, if if somebody wasn't buying into the Air DNA product, is there a way of them getting that sort of information just by looking on on the um, listing platforms? No. <laughs> that was emphatic. <laughs> yeah, no is no is a short answer. I mean, what we've tried to do is build this into our market grade, and it is in um, you know one of our market grades is kind of that how quick a, a property it can get to full occupancy. Um, but yeah, I know it, it. That's you know. These are a lot of the little insights that we build air DNA around, right? We're monitoring every property every single day that comes on the platform, every new booking that happens. And so we can get this great historical view on, on how properties are coming to market and how successful they're being. Are you able to analyze the repeat business? We can. If somebody leaves you two reviews, we can, we can analyze repeat business. Uh, but it's not very common on most of the platforms for somebody to, to leave multiple reviews. Um, but we do track, you know, w- where people are traveling from or where they're traveling to by looking at all the reviews left on the platforms. So we can see, you know, in Toronto, where are people are traveling from at what times of the year. And this is helping people from a marketing perspective, figuring out like, where they should be advertising, if they're going to advertise in Google AdWords or other places. Um, and we can see how much repeat business people are getting uh, or make some good assumptions about it. Um, but we don't have a ton of data on travelers and their sort of identities, as you can imagine, that's pretty sensitive these days. And so we try not to track too much information on the actual traveler experience. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always very interested in the, in the area of repeat rentals because, you know, certainly in, up in our market, and you know our market up here in, um, in cottage country, that uh, that repeat guests are sort of the holy grail. If you can get them to come back year after year after year, um, same week every year. I, mean, I, I know a number of owners who who haven't marketed for a long time because it's just the same people who come back year after year. Are there any? Do you know of any markets uh, aside from that where this is this is a common occurrence? Nothing really comes to mind, actually. And I, it, my theory has always been that that's going to go away, right? As there is like a proliferation of options. And people are booking more last minute, you know, not people aren't booking nine months or a year in advance. They're booking you know, three days or nine days in advance. Um, and as there's more guarantees about the consistency of the places, I've, I've always felt that that will start to erode repeat business. Um, so what, how have you seen that? Are you still seeing that that is kind of the bread and butter of your market is repeat business or is that on the decline? I, I think I think it's it, it, it is on the decline. It's it's a, it's on the same sort of decline as the whole summer rental. Do you remember when you know the grandparents used to book a property for the entire summer, and and they would go there for for eight or ten weeks and invite all the grandchildren, and that just does not happen anymore. And that's it, you know it, ten years ago that was quite commonplace. 
So, mm -hmm. so I, I do see that and I do see people coming back to us as a, as a rental agency year after year and saying now, now saying, well, we've gone to the same place for the last 10 years, but we're, we're thinking of somewhere different this year. So, so I'm not sure if it's, you know, if it's a trend for us as an agency to get worried about, uh, as yet, but, uh, but certainly it's something I always, always advise owners is never rely on that market. You know, don't, yeah. don't stop the marketing because there will always come a gap that you're going to need to fill at some point in the future. You know, if you haven't paid attention to your property for a few years, um, because you become, and people become complacent when they've got lots of repeat guests and then they mm. lose them, then it's a, that's a tough job then to build that business back up again. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I hear a lot of talk in the, in the, in the space around, you know, how you're going to retargeting your, your previous guests, you know, getting your email uh, campaigns together, making sure you're, you're staying in touch with previous guests. And I, I, I don't have any real evidence on that, how successful that is, but I just think the market's moving away from that. I mean, obviously it's great if you can avoid paying fees and you can rely on those customers coming back to you. But like I said, people are looking for uniqueness. They're looking for something different. There's so many different options out there these days. And I just see that moving uh, the market moving away from that going forward, but uh, you, you have more evidence than I do mm -hmm. to kind of dispel that or, or not. Yeah, and I guess it's the same in in terms of of some of the more traditional um, elements that some people are still clinging on to, which is the, you know we only rent by the week and it's got to be Saturday Saturday. Yeah, that always boggles my mind when people are still you know stuck in the in the old paradigm of vacation rentals it's just not how people are thinking about these these days right and so yeah we got to stay nimble and adjust for the times because times are changing very quickly uh right now so in terms of what a new investor takes into account before entering the short-term rental market so we, we we mentioned regulations obviously it's important to 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 be cognizant of what's not only what is currently there but what might be what might be around the corner um saturation um, seasonality. Is there anything else? I mean, there's a couple of other things to think about um, when investing in vacation rentals is that it isn't just about the location of the property and the value of the property. I mean, people need to think about why people are traveling. You know, I think uh, family travel, I think business travel are, are really huge growing segments of this market that people aren't paying that much attention to. So when you're thinking about a property, you got to be thinking about how you're going to be decorating this property, how you're going to be marketing this property, who is your perfect target customer. And I don't think people put enough time and energy into kind of the decoration, the marketing, and, and who they're trying to really market towards. And there's always, there's going to be niches in this space. There's going to be people advertising to the musician coming to town, to the nurse coming to town, to the teacher coming to town, to the family coming to town. So you got to really start to think like a real marketing pro about who exactly you're trying to target and how you can decorate and market towards those people. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, I did a, a webinar last week about personas and trying to get across to why it's important to define your target market. You know, no self-respecting automobile company will put an ad out before <laughs> thinking about who they're targeting their Hyundai Sport to or, or their Jeep or their Lexus. You know, and every commercial is is different depending on who that target market is. So and I think what you talked about at the beginning of this episode is that there is this growth of this kind of stale corporate rental hotel sort of stay. And I think that will go away eventually as people figure out really kind of what is unique, how to decorate, how to figure out how to target the right market. You don't, you don't really want to have, like, you're not staging a home for sale, right? I always, like, I always think about it like that. When you're selling a home, you paint all the walls white, and you put up nothing offensive. I think it's going to go the opposite way, where you're going to really try to figure out how to put up things that really speak to a very target audience. You don't need all 10,000 people staying in your city to be staying at your place. All you need is one person per night, and how are you going to find that one person that's really going to find and love your place? Yeah, it, uh, and it, but it's, it's tough. That, that's a tough call, actually, to get people – thinking like that to put that um that very targeted hat on rather than saying well you know there's, there's hundred thousand people out there and i want them all so i'm going to you know throw the spaghetti out and ho hope it's you know hope it sticks on the wall yeah i just think it's, it's a different kind of way of thinking about it and uh 
I know that's what I did when I had my properties, right? I had my like surfer place. I had my music place. I had my very kid friendly place. I really just thought about, I, I just need one person here per night. I don't need everybody staying here. With that in mind, um, thinking about um, urban rentals, when you're looking at locations, what what actually matters to guests? One of the things, that, you know, I'm coming back to Nashville again because I remember talking to somebody a while back and he said, just look at my reviews. And every review said that the best thing about the property was it had a designated parking space. <laughs> Um, because they were they were coming in, you know, for, for people who were driving in, and the you know it is it, it's a fly in and a drive in destination. But people who were driving in, they they didn't want to be parking half a mile down the road and and leaving their car somewhere where they 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 couldn't see it from the property. So right. you know, do, how how much do you feel that uh, that matters? I mean, I think it's tough to generalize in terms of amenities that are important or when location is particularly important. <laughs> You know, I think kind of going off of our last conversation, what I do recommend to people is look at where amenities are lacking, right? So if it is a parking spot in this circumstance, that's great. Like if that's, if you have a parking spot, then you should be advertising that really high in your listing. You know, sometimes it's, it's other sorts of amenities that people are looking for. I don't know, maybe it's a jacuzzi or a pool or, or something else. It, it's just, it's hard to really generalize what is most important. I think if you really wanted to put one thing on it, it's walkability. Eh, look at your walkability score. If it's great, it's probably going to be pretty good as an urban rental. Uh, but in terms of specific amenities, it's really just it's specific to the markets that you're in. Yeah, because you know, if you think about beach rentals, I, I remember doing some research on properties in, um, I think it was Panama City Beach, and one particular condo block that had maybe, I mean, there must have been 30 or 40 listings in that same block of, um, of apartments. And the, the, the properties that shone out, the ones that were charging, they were charging more, but they were fully booked and they had the best reviews, were the ones that offered free beach chairs. <laughs> because in every review it said, you know, free beach chairs, $140 value for the week. And in all the reviews, it was, you know, I, I chose this because of the free beach chairs, because I don't want to spend the, you know, another $140 to go and rent them. When in fact, that money was built in to the rental rate because the rental rate was higher than their neighbors. Well, right. And those beach chairs weren't very expensive, were they? No. I hope they were $140 <laughs> beach chairs. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I totally agree ways to stand out with that sort of stuff. I had beach cruisers at my properties, you know, little tiny touches and amenities that you can add to the property, you know, make it stand out, but you got to make it stand out in your marketing. You got to understand what people are looking for and you know, what's going to be when somebody's comparing 20 places, the beach chair, that's going to make them kind of press your button and book your place. It's really important. I, I know this because as, as a guest, I've, I've rented places that, uh, always like to rent a place that has a hot tub. And, you know, the last three places we've been to that's had a hot tub, we've never used it. <laughs> but it was there. And we rented it because of that, because it just had that extra amenity. It was like, well, if we want to use the hot tub, there is one. And, and in fact, that drove us to put hot tubs in, in all six properties that we've had. And, and I encourage our owners up here to do that, particularly in the winter, because, you know, what else are you going to do in winter in uh, cottage country, Ontario? You, you either sit by the fire, you walk in the snow, you sit by the fire, or you sit in the hot tub. It's funny, yeah, you mentioned hot tubs. I mean, I've, I've talked to Airbnb a bit about how they, you know, educate their host and how they can help hosts reinvest in their properties. And the example they always use is the hot tub. I mean, they are certain that hot tubs, you know, especially in ski destinations, is just a no-brainer. Like it's, you know, like three times the return in its first year. And, it, you know, they don't know why everybody isn't investing, you know, three to five thousand dollars in a hot tub. Uh, so there, there's definitely investments like that, that, you know, pay dividends really quickly in this space. So, so I guess for in, in investors in a, in a new location, it's a matter of finding out, you know, what is it in this location that is going to give me that competitive edge? Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds easy, but obviously it's a bit more complicated, right? There's only so many amenities listed on, on the platform and you've got to, you know, you got to think about it. Yeah, this is a ski town or, or a beach town or a lake town, you know, or 
river, you know, the canoes or the options, the floaty devices or whatever, you know, just adding those little small touches go a long way. I want to go back to regulations now because it's it, it's gone absolutely nuts around here in the last few months. And I think, you know, New Year came and all the municipalities and townships decided that this year was going to be the year that um, that they sort of hit the ground running on regulations. And there's meetings in townships and in municipalities um, across the area over the next couple of months. Um, and I know of people who've already made or who've already invested uh, in cottage property up here who are all sitting on tenterhooks to see what, what's going to come up. But let, in, in the wider picture across the U.S., how are regulations in general impacting investment opportunities? Depends in what lens you're looking at it. Professional investors, surprisingly, love regulation. <laughs> Professional investors like regulation because they know how to get the proper permit, the zoning in place, how to get the right paperwork in place to get legal supply. And so they know that when there's regulation, that not everybody is listing their back house or investing in a single property. And so it limits supply, which then makes them more money in the, in the long term. And for the individual in the investor, it makes it a little bit more tricky because you're not going to be in t- investing the time or the money uh, in trying to figure out how, what the legal gray areas or how to get supply in the market that isn't going to get fined. Um, so, it, you know, it depends. You know, I've been really surprised that, you know, regulation isn't a bad thing for everybody. It's typically a bad thing for the small guys. <laughs> and the small guys have to get really creative about, you know, where is the right, where is the right place or where is the right zoning or how are they going to get the right you know, piece of paper to, get to be legal in that market? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could go on and on about that. I mean, regulation is obviously very complex. There's a lot of people and there's a lot of powerful people that are, that have the ears of these regulators, right? It's typically the hotel market and it's typically, you know, a misinformation campaign about, you know, fears about safety or about, uh, the affordability of local housing. I think these are all pretty unfounded arguments and can be proven to be unfounded from a, you know, an actual analytical standpoint. Um, so it's going to be a long battle and it's interesting to see kind of where the pendulum is going to swing next. It's definitely swung to the side of the hotels. Uh, I'm still hopeful that it'll swing back to the side of uh, homeowners and small time entrepreneurs in the near future. What, what can people do to, um, to, to do something positive, to make, to make an impact by themselves? I mean, I think we know that the answer is, you know, be vocal and, and, and get involved. And people, I've, I've seen lots of bad regulation get stalled because people show up and people make noise. And, uh, you know, and I think it really does make a big difference. So you got to figure out, you know, where your city council is, what's on the agenda, and when to show up and, and make your voice heard. Yeah, I remember um, seeing what was happening in Seattle um, a year or two back when... Um, Sea to Sky Rentals and Derek Eaton of Seattle Oasis Vacation Rentals got together and they built a very powerful um, lobbying voice just by getting together and pulling in other owners and, and getting together uh, at the council meeting um, in force. And that uh, apparently took the council aback the first time they, they did that and they all arrived in their green T-shirts all sat down in in a big group and, and Derek Derek said to me you know it's probably more people that ever been in that council chamber for for a, for a long long time of course after that they lost the element of surprise <laughs> but uh, but it it did work it did work the power of groups getting together like that and and appearing in in support of the positive side and responsible renting and that sort of thing does does seem to work and it's far better than sitting back and just watching it happen and doing nothing right i mean we all have to do our part too just make sure we have nice properties that are you know aren't the party houses aren't causing problems and that the neighbors aren't up in arms right because one neighbor who gets scared about the strangers next door can make a lot of noise and is heard right so we all just kind of do our part that we're you know we're doing the right thing we're having the right types of guests and we're monitoring the activity of our properties well Scott, tell us tell us a little bit more now about um, about Air DNA, what it can do for um, real estate investors, property managers, you know, anybody that's wanting to get into this this business. Sure, at Air DNA, we're tracking over six million properties on a daily basis to really understand 
uh, at a very granular level, you know, how well property is performing and performing around the world. Uh, so we have market reports. We have uh, lots of different ways to access our data. Uh, the sort of investment products, market research products or APIs um, that we help people target the right markets and figure out how to operate and price those properties very competitively. Um, I guess that's the short 60 second uh, spiel there. <laughs> so so <laughs> you, you've got products for independent um, people as well as the, the larger um, investment com- uh, corporations? Yeah, I mean, our, our vision really, I mean, when I started this company, my vision was to support the small business owner, entrepreneur in this space. And that's still what we're committed to today. Uh, you can see our product, Market Minder, it's priced on average 30 bucks a month, very affordable for kind of a smaller operator. And so we want to provide all of the insights we're providing to the Hiltons and Heights of the world to that individual operator. And we were, we're focused on creating product sets that empower that individual vacation rental entrepreneur. Well, I'll be putting links to um, AirDNA at the, um, at the foot of the show notes. So, you know, if you want to find out a little bit more, then definitely go to those show notes. And, and if you want to leave a comment on that, then uh, I'll ask Scott to get, uh, get back to you. Um, oh, it's one other point before I let you go, Scott. You wrote a, a blog post called what, what, is, what is an Airbnb? Airbnb super host status uh, really worth? And uh, I found, I, you know, this is just going off on a little bit of a tangent because I, I, I liked that post. It came in just as my, about, I saw it just about 10 minutes after my sister had called me and she said, I've just got my super host status. And she was so excited. And I, and I began to think, I was thinking then, well, what does that actually mean? And then I, I, read, I read your post. So what, what's your view on the super host status and, and if it really does matter anymore? Does it make a difference? I was surprised by the number of properties that have achieved super host status. Almost 20% of hosts that have had a property on the platform for the year have achieved that status. So that was pretty surprising to me. But more surprising was how much better those properties are actually performing. I mean, if we look at the occupancy rate alone, it sounds about 80% higher for super hosts around the world than non-super hosts. And typically, we saw that occupancy you know, during the lower time periods, you know, during days, uh, months of the year that were either you know, low, <laughs> low demand or days of the week, like Sunday through Wednesday, and they're in lower demand. That, uh, so we were really surprised to see. You know, I thought it was sort of just kind of a badge of honor and that maybe you get a few more clicks on your listing because you had that badge there. But it really is equating to significantly more revenue, more occupancy, and a much more successful host on the platform. Yeah, well, thanks, yeah, thanks for that. And I, I would encourage anybody listening to go and take, you know, if, 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 you're, if you are starting out in Airbnb and you know, think, thinking ahead to gaining the super host status, um, definitely interesting to, to go and take a look at that blog post because uh, – I know that when my sister started, and she just has an, a, an, a, a small, well, she, it's, it's not quite an apartment. She has no cooking facilities, but it's in the basement of her home. So it's, it's a very small operation. But she just started in January, and, and she does one-night bookings, which is something that's just unheard of in this market up here. And she has been just about solidly booked throughout the winter. And I found this a really, really interesting that... A, that she took this approach and she did the one-nighters because I've always been thoroughly opposed to, to that just because of the work involved. But, uh, but secondly, that she achieved that, this super host status so fast and, and now she's able to put, she, she's now putting her prices up and the demand is not stopping. I guess that super host status does matter. So yeah, thanks for that. No, my pleasure. Yeah, we've been right a lot more kind of, Data-driven stuff. You know, we have a lot of data at our fingertips. So we're always trying to figure out new uh, article content that, you know, is really going to be helpful to the community. So always happy to get feedback on, you know, how we can use our data to you know, make better decisions out there. Yeah. Well, great. Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure, as ever, <laughs> to talk with you. I hope we don't have to wait another three years. <laughs> it's great talking to you, too, Heather. Uh, yep. Hope we, hope we chat again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> Well, many thanks to Scott Shatford of AirDNA for that great insight into 
investing in uh, Airbnb properties. I say Airbnb properties, but, you know, it's investing in any short-term rental home that you might then put onto Airbnb or maybe onto uh, HomeAway or Booking.com. And I, I sometimes, I don't give Booking.com the, um, the, the, the references as much as I should. And I will be having a full discussion with somebody from booking, Booking.com in the next few weeks. So watch out for that. Um, booking.com are a bronze sponsor of uh, the Vacation Rental Success Summit. And, and I hope that if you are going to come to VRSS, that you come and visit all our sponsors and exhibitors because there's a lot of them this year. We are so delighted with the um, response we have. And and for those of you who are coming to VRSS, you know, you're going to get to um, meet the speakers, uh, attend the workshops and the seminars, um, enjoy the wonderful location in San Antonio, and also spend time with with these vendors, vendors who are offering so many services and resources um, to help you succeed in business. So if you'd like to go and see who our sponsors and exhibitors are, please go to vacationrentalsuccesssummit.com. You can check those out. You can also um, check out who our speakers are this year. And we are still adding new speakers. So, you know, check back regularly on that because our agenda for the summit is going to be published very, very soon. And finally, 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 trying to think of what my finally was. Finally, thank you so much for joining me this week. And I'll look forward to being with you again very soon. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business.